Good evening. Uh, this is Dr. Unger, and um, uh, this is a Sibley uh, webinar. This is a information uh, educational series that we run at Sibley Hospital. Uh, tonight's presentation is going to be about robotic surgery for knee replacements. Um, if you have any questions tonight, I'd like everybody to hold their questions to the end. Uh, this will allow us to get through the presentation. It should be relatively short, maybe 20 or 30 minutes at the very most. And then I'll entertain questions uh, for hopefully 20 or 30 minutes. So I'm gonna share my screen now and give me a moment here and we can get started. Okay, can everybody, can you see my screen? Kathy, can you send me a message if you can see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, we, uh, this is about total knee replacements. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about arthritis of the knee and then surgical options, which are knee replacements and the new evolution of knee replacement technology is to use robotic technology. A couple of uh, little uh, bullet points first about who I am. Uh, my name is Dr. Anthony S. Unger. I am the uh, medical director for the Gildentorn Institute for Bone and Joint Health at Sibley Hospital. I am a professor of orthopedic surgery at the GW Medical School, board certified, and a charter member of the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. This is an organization where most joint replacement surgeons belong. Uh, it's the organization that certainly you should look for in terms of uh, if you're going to have any orthopedic surgery on your hip and knee replacement. I'm a partner in the, uh, uh, an organization called WASM or Washington Orthopedic and Sports Medicine. So I wanted to put this up very quickly because this is a virtual meeting um, and we don't have a chance to interact with each other and for me to hand out cards. But uh, if everybody wants to write down briefly, our office is at Sibley Hospital. We also have an office at Chevy in Chevy Chase and in downtown Washington, our phone number uh, for the Chevy Chase office, our main office is 301-657-1996. And you can get a hold of me through email, drunger at wassum.com. Okay, so today's topic is about robotic surgery. And uh, this is a breakthrough technology that uses computers and robots, robotic assistants essentially, to achieve an accurate and individualized result. I wanna point out that this is not a autonomous robotic treatment. In other words, you're not going in and having surgery and Dr. Unger is sitting in another room and the robot's doing your surgery. This is robotic assisted. So it's an operation in which we use technology to get better orientation of, uh, of uh, the implants that we put in. This is obviously very important uh, for um, uh, surgery. Uh, there are a couple little vignettes here. Uh, here's a little vignette of uh, the burring of the uh, bone, uh, the uh, orientation of the uh, implants, uh, assessing what we call the gap. This is a picture of the uh, implant itself, of the uh, uh, robot uh, technology itself. So let me move ahead here. So to begin with, we have to talk a little bit about what is arthritis. Arthritis uh, essentially of the knee, there's obviously arthritis of your hip, but we're talking primarily about bad arthritis of the knee that will require a joint replacement. And arthritis is a degenerative bone disease that causes the cartilage, which is a cushion between the bones to break down. This is the most common form of arthritis, and it's the leading, leading cause of disability in the United States. And 45% of people will develop arthritis, or OA, over their lifetime, according to uh, one study. Here's a picture on the right-hand side of uh, arthritis. So if you look at this, uh, this uh, cartoon, as you might uh, say, here's a, a normal knee. I'm gonna draw a picture around a normal knee here. The cartilage is this creamy colored material between the bones. This is the thigh bone up here and the tibial bone down below. And you can imagine this is a cap of ice on either side of the bone that allows the bone to glide past each other. 
And the, the cap of ice is uh, about a half inch in, in thickness and it covers the end of the bone, allows the bone to go back and forth. Unfortunately, cartilage, as you can see on the right hand side can become degraded or disappear over time and that's called arthritis. So the picture on the right is a knee that has very bad arthritis. And you can see there are patches of cartilage, but mostly the bone, which is the sort of tan colored material is poking through and the bones are rubbing together, causing friction, stiffness and pain occurs, uh, which, which causes swelling. Sometimes when the bones rub together and there is more rubbing on one side than the other, the bones can become angular or what we call deformed. So the knees can become knock kneed or they can become angular like um, uh, what we call a, a, a varus knee where there'll be sort of like a cowboy knee uh, and there'll be uneven wear. So this is the typical uh, pattern of osteoarthritis. So, but it comes in various stages. In uh, early stage, which is you see here on the left-hand side and you see the different areas of the knee, this is usually where you have small little defects in the cartilage. And this is usually due to sports injuries and it causes minor loss of cartilage. And the thing I wanna point out to you, everybody, is that cartilage, once damaged, does not regrow. Even though there have been some attempts to find ways to regrow cartilage or to even get regeneration of cartilage, there is to date no way that you can do this. When you enter the mid-stage uh, portion, which you can see in the middle here, you can see the cartilage is beginning to disappear on one side, as you can see, the other side looks pretty good and there's increased pain, mobility is reduced and uh, it usually occurs in one or two car, uh, areas of what we call the compartments of the knee. This diagram on the uh, end here shows the end stage where there's really no cartilage left, there's severe pain, you're having difficulty walking, climbing stairs, and all of the uh, areas of the knee are involved. So this is the progression of arthritis. Now, unfortunately, most knees, when they get arthritis, do progress over time. So most knees will end up with significant amounts of arthritis. Here's what the x-rays look like. This is what the orthopedic surgeon does. He takes an x-ray and you can see this is an x-ray, a normal healthy knee. And what we look for here is what we call the cartilage spaces. This is the area where that cartilage is between the bone. This is the thigh bone, this is the tibial bone. Here is a knee that has a little bit of arthritis and you can see this is a little bit narrow. This is jacked open a little bit, but there's a little bit of wear. And then when you go over here and this knee has got, as you can see, angular issues, right? So this knee is starting to curve a little bit and it's got a lot of wear on the inside here. There's some bone loss here this side is involved as well. So these are knees that have progressed over time. And at this point, maybe a candidate for surgery. But let's talk a little bit about what the other options are before you have an operation. And these are the major issues that we use in orthopedics today or the major uh, treatment paradigms. One is weight loss. Lose weight absolutely will help your knee a lot. Five or 10 pounds makes a tremendous amount of difference. So we'll always ask you to try to lose some weight changes in your activity or lifestyle. So instead of going running every day on your bad knee and making your knee more aggravated, we might ask you to ride a bike or go swimming or use an elliptical. So activity modifications is really very effective. Anti-inflammatory medications are very effective. Unfortunately, anti-inflammatory medications have lots of side effects. These are the Advils, the Motrins, the Celebrexes, the Volterans as well as the gels that you put on your knee, like Voltaren gel and assorted other things. They are effective, but they have lots of side effects. So generally uh, there's limited application of this in terms of treating arthritis. Cortisone injections were the mainstay of treating arthritis for many years. If you go back 20 or 30 years, most of the rheumatologists were giving cortisone shots over and over again. We're, we're sort of not very excited about doing multiple cortisone shots in bad knees because cortisone cortisone or steroids does degrade the cartilage. So we don't like that too much. We'll generally do one or two of those. The next thing that we use is something called hyaluronic acid or the so-called gel injection. You may have heard about that. 
And that's very effective. It's a lubrication of the knee. Essentially, we're injecting the same fluid that's in your knee in a very high concentration. It does not regenerate the cartilage, but it will reduce the inflammation. And that's what, that's what it's effective for. It comes in various forms as many manufacturers. Sometimes it comes in a one shot a situation. Sometimes it occurs with three or five shots. It only can be administered every six months, unfortunately. And if it doesn't work, you have to look for other options. Braces help. There are some good braces that work for knees that can what we call unload the knee and we'll occasionally use that. TENS units are electrical or physical therapy units that can sometimes reduce the pain. And then we get into the more esoteric or what we call investigational issues. This is the so-called stem cells. And I wanna point out again, even though it's stem cells, it does not regenerate cartilage. It just does reduce inflammation. And then there's other things like PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, which falls into this category, again, of controlling inflammation. So these are the things that you do before you get your knee replaced or you go to the orthopedic surgeon and you say, I give up and I wanna have surgery. So what are the surgical options? Well, here's what you can do when you have early arthritis, very limited amount of arthritis. You could do something called an arthroscopy where the surgeon looks in the knee with a telescope and can clean out the arthritis. Very limited applications in arthritis, very limited applications. Occasionally we use this in very young patients uh, where we don't want to go into the other operations like a joint replacement. So we'll sometimes use that in young patients, but most, most, mostly it's for uh, very limited applications. I'm going to talk a little bit about a partial knee tonight. This is where we replace one part of the joint. There you can see it right there. And that's in early to mild stage arthritis. And then of course, the old, ultimate solution is a knee replacement, an ultimate uh, uh, solution to replace the whole joint. And that's what that looks like. And this is a very good operation replacing all the components of the knee, the compartments of the knee. So here's what the, uh, the, the implants look like. This is what a partial knee replacement looks like. This is what a full knee replacement looks like. Here's another picture. Everybody can see that. Doesn't come out very well. Partial and versus full. So which one would be right for you? Well, the orthopedic surgeon is the one really to guide you whether you should have a partial or full. Partials work very well, but they only really are limited to a very small segment of the population. From my practice, is only 15 to 20% at the very most. This is what a full knee replacement looks like. And you can see the difference. Here's the remaining cartilage, the normal healthy cartilage, and we've just replaced part of the knee. Here's a full knee replacement. We've resurfaced or re uh, replaced the full knee. The partial has advantages and in that 95% of patients that have had this operation really like it. It works very well. It spares the ligaments and the tissue. There's much less pain with a partial, quicker recovery, better range of motion, small incisions. Most of these operations are done as outpatients. The limitations are that only 20% of the patients that have arthritis are probably going to have uh, a, a little bit of arthritis where they could have a partial replacement. So as I said before, most of the patients, 80% or even 90% of the patients I see need a full knee replacement, can't have a partial knee replacement. But if you're a candidate for it, it's certainly a very good operation. You have to have these other things in, in uh, a knee. You can't have a um, inflammatory arthritis. You can't have, uh, uh, you got, you got to have an intact ACL and you can't have what we call disease in other compartments. So again, if you look at partial knee replacements, this is an overall picture, 81% are going to get full knee replacements and uh, the other uh, are going to get partial. I'm going to move this over maybe. So actually I'll move it over here. So you can see partial is this, other is that. So not too many people are good candidates for partial. Move that over. Okay, here we go. So accuracy in surgery does matter. And I think that's what this whole talk is about, that these technologies that, are, that we've, we have today improve the accuracy. The better the accuracy, the better the result. The better the outcome, the more satisfied you will be. So I put these uh, x-rays up. These are just partial knee replacements. And you can sort of see if you go down the line here, 
These are all partials and they're not very good. These are done not by me, but <laughs> they're, they're, they're procedures in which you could find fault with each one of these x-rays. They're a little crooked, they're not so great. You know, the surgeon did the best job he could possibly do, but they don't really, uh, uh, really look very good. So what about full knee replacements? And I wanna point out to uh, the audience that full knee replacements is a very effective procedure. It is one of the most successful procedures in all of medicine. I would say that for hip and knee replacements in general. There are over 600,000 of these performed every year and it's probably a lot more now, probably up to close to a million. And 90% of the patients have a dramatic reduction in pain and significant improvement in the ability to perform activities of daily living, 90%. We're trying to get to 100%, and that's what this technology is about. We're trying to get the other 10% of the people who say, yeah, I had my knee replaced, I'm happy I did it, my knee feels great, much better than before, but it's not spectacular. And we want everybody to be spectacular. And that's where I think the robotic stuff helps us. So this is what a robotic assistant is. Robotic assistant provides accuracy. And I want to uh, uh, really uh, highlight that. They can improve the function and feel of potential longevity of knee replacements. Robotic assistant is available for partial knee replacements and now for full knee replacements. This is the robotic platform. And I want to point out to, to the audience, again, this is just an interactive uh, 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 video screen that we use to guide us in the placement of the implant. So it's not, again, a robot and in, like you might see in a GM factory with you know, a robotic arm coming in and doing the procedure. This is just our interface with the technology where we can plan out how to perform the implant surgery, look at how we're going to perform, uh, per, uh, perform the implant surgery, and then get real-time feedback as we're doing the procedure to tell us whether we have to make adjustments. So this has a really, really valuable technology. Here's the, the usual way, and these are the instruments. And again, I've been doing knee replacements for 35 years, and I'm pretty good at doing them. And I use standard instruments many, many, many times, and I have great results. But I can tell you sometimes the robotic can give me a little extra um, uh, accuracy. So these are the standard implants that are available. These are what we call the mechanical guides. So here's what the robotic in interface looks like. And I just wanted to turn these things on and go through these with everybody here briefly. Just... Okay, there we go. Okay. This one's not playing. So, so here you can see, you can see in these pictures here, this is the interface that we get where we can look at the, how the implant sits on the bone. Here you can see in this, in this picture down here, you can see this is our handheld instrument, which allows us to shape the bone. So we can use this implant and the robot, the interface is giving us information on a real time basis, whether we need to shave a little bit more, whether we need to uh, take a little bit more bone, a little bit less bone. And that's what the interface gives us. So we start with, let's say a picture like this, and then the implant, uh, the, uh, the burr, which is a, what we call a haptic burr, comes in and it can help us shape the bone. So it's absolutely perfectly shaped and the implant then can be uh, placed in a perfect position. And this is another interface that we have in which we can look at what we call the balance. In other words, we can look how the implant sits in the bone and how the soft tissue reacts to the implant. So this gives us very important information where we might want to adjust the position of the implant to make the balance better. So all of these screens are available to us as we're doing the procedure. Not all at once, obviously, there are different steps that we go through when we're doing this procedure. So here you can see the mapping that we do. So during the procedure, we can map. Everybody likes to have customization so in this, in this video, 
you can see we are mapping the femur. In other words, we are taking a pointer and we are finding the exact shape of the end of the bone. So this is a way of exactly fitting the implant to the bone. So we can map out for the computer exactly what the bone looks like and then fit the exact implant to that piece of bone so that it provides the perfect position and perfect uh, size for that particular uh, bone. So that's a very valuable part of the procedure. So robotics designed to precisely align implants. And again, we're using this, this uh, automotive sort of uh, analogy that poor alignment will lead to uneven wear. In other words, if you put the implant in and it's aligned, but it's not perfectly aligned, it may not last as long. It may not work as well. Your tire analogy is, the, is a very good analogy that you know, if you go to the, get your new tires and it's not perfectly aligned and balanced, it's not gonna wear very well and that implant may not work out to be perfect. So here's x-rays of implants that I considered, as you saw the bad ones before, and now you can see these are all done with computers and every one of them across the board is perfect, perfect, perfect every time. And we can do that with knee replacements. Here you see a knee replacement perfectly aligned perfectly positioned. And that's the real benefit of, of this uh, technology. So the closing points, what are the benefits of this system? It's the robotic assistance, assistance for uh, partial and full knee replacements provide an accurate and individualized planning. The big advantages to us, and the reason why I particularly like this system is that I don't have to have you go and get a CT a computerized tomography or picture or MRI beforehand, I can collect all the information in surgery, which can allow me to provide you with a custom implant. It can be used for partial and full knee replacements. The best candidates for this is gonna be patients who are gonna have outpatient uh, knee replacements, either partial or full knee replacements. And these patients are basically gonna be healthy patients with minimal medical problems, these procedures are done in a one to two hour procedure. They're usually done in an outpatient setting, usually done with spinal anesthesia and a regional block. And all the patients, I wanna emphasize, all the patients go home that same day and receive physical therapy at home. So these are all done in an outpatient setting uh, as, uh, as indicated here in this, in this slide. So last slide I have again is my contact information. If you need to hear more about robotic surgery or if you have a bad knee where you're considering a knee replacement, here's my contact information, Sibley office, phone number, take this down and you can come in and, and have a consultation with me at any time and we can discuss whether you're a good candidate for this particular procedure. So I'd like to open this up now to questions and I'm going to stop the share and we can hopefully get questions. Okay. And if you'd like to ans uh, ask any questions, there's a thing that uh, you can see on the right-hand side here where I've indicated it. it's called question and answer. And you should click on that. And then you can type in your question and I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, so, and, and you can ask me anything about knee replacements, Sibley Hospital, joint replacements in general. I'm here for however long we're gonna take these questions. I, I love questions. So I want everybody to ask as many questions as they possibly can. Okay, so the first question, I'm gonna read the questions. I have OA in both knees, but the real problem now is both menisci in one knee are torn, one badly, and a medium badly torn in the other. Cortisone helps some but I think replacements are likely in my solution. What are your thoughts? Okay. So I'm gonna answer that question. Um, so I will tell you that the most common thing that I see is patients coming, I'll move this over a little bit so people can see me, people coming to the office with MRIs with very arthritic knees and they're being told by another physician or maybe a family member that they should have the menisci treated. Once you have significant amounts of arthritis, dealing with the meniscus, whether that's arthroscopically 
or by some other means is not going to help you. So I think most of those judgments are made at the time of the office visit. When patients come in the office, we take x-rays, we look at the MRI, we look at your knee. And I, I'm, I'm just saying most of the time when I see patients that have significant amounts of arthritis and they ask me, should I get my knee arthroscopically treated or Dr. So-and-so said my knee should be arthroscopically treated, that's not the right way to go. It's treat the arthritis because arthritis is usually the overwhelming issue for most knees that have, at least by x-ray, significant amounts of joint, uh, space, uh, joint space uh, narrowing. So for this particular person, I would say deal with, deal with the arthritis, don't deal with the meniscus, cortisone may be a temporary issue, but replacements are probably necessary and something to be uh, thought about in the future. Okay, so I have from David, how can I share this presentation? And I, I would uh, refer you to Kathy Pulford, who's the clinical coordinator at Sibley Hospital. And I think she can give you some information about, this is being recorded tonight, by the way, so that if somebody wanted to see this uh, going forward, they can access this uh, through Kathy Pulford. So I will, um, um, so we've answered that question. Keep the questions coming. Okay, Patricia, what is the recovery? And I'll click on that. What is the recovery time for total knee replacements? Okay, that's a very good question. So the operations are generally done outpatient. Patients go home the same day uh, they usually spend about a week or so in their house getting physical therapy. Then they come to the office and we change their bandage, make sure everything's okay. Uh, usually they have a waterproof bandage the first week or two. The bandage comes off. We send them to outpatient physical therapy. Most people who have the left knee done can uh, drive a car in two to four weeks. If it's a right knee where you have to manage a car, uh, you probably want to drive a car in four to six weeks. Travel is four to six weeks. Full recovery from a knee replacement when you're out playing golf and tennis is 10 to 12 weeks. That's on the average. Very good question. Okay, Jerry, what knee issues lend themselves best to robotic surgery? Okay, so I, I think that the, the arthritis issue, in other words, if you have just a normal knee and your surgeon says you have a torn ligament or the meniscus is damaged and you're a younger patient, robotic surgery is not necessary. This is mostly for people who are gonna have a bad knee with very significant amounts of arthritis and they're gonna basically gonna be a candidate for a knee replacement. So that's where robotic surgery is really valuable. So thank you for that question. Okay, are there certain manufactured knees that you prefer over others on the market? Okay, so let me answer that question. And the question again is a certain manufacturer. I, I at this point in time, I'm pr primarily using a knee made by a company named Smith & Nephew. It's an excellent knee. I've used all the implants that are available. Um, I must say, I think there's very minor differences between one knee versus the other. I don't think that I could claim that one knee has got superior... Uh, characteristics because it's going to last 25 years more than the other knee. So I would say to you, don't pick the surgeon based upon what implants that surgeon uses. It's mostly pick that surgeon based upon their experience and uh, their reputation. So that's, that's how I would uh, pick a surgeon. Can you speak about, okay, uh, anom anonymous attendee, can you speak about the implants themselves? Yes, the implants have have been around for a long time. I mean, knee replacements have been around for almost 60 years. They've changed a little bit over time. They've become, I think, more anatomical. They used to be uh, a little bit more rudimentary. Uh, so they've, they've been designed to give patients more flexion, more stability, uh, better performance. They've made some modifications, but not dramatic modifications, not dramatic modifications. Uh, well, most of the implants are cemented today. We're using a lot of, we're, we're seeing the, uh, the advent and the, uh, the development now of a lot of uncemented technology for young patients. They look very good. Uh, so you're going to see much more of that going forward. Um, but I think that's the world of implants today. Implants come in two different categories. There's what we call 
a CR knee, a knee where the ligaments are somewhat preserved and the other implant that we use in more, more developed arthritis, more significant amounts of arthritis is called a posterior stabilized knee. And that's a knee where uh, some of the ligaments are sacrificed and the, and the implant itself makes up for uh, some of the deficiencies of the, uh, of the ligaments. That's a very good question there. Okay, how long do knee replacements usually last? How long do new re knee replacements usually last? Great question. Okay, so there have been a lot of studies and I would tell you that modern knee replacements are 20 to 30 years. That's my opinion, 20 to 30 years. There have been many studies, and again, this is looking back in time, uh, showing you know 99% at 10 years, uh, probably uh, 20 years, you're probably looking at 95, 96%. Between 20 and 30 years, you might get another five or 10% drop off. But I, I guess the, the point I'd like to make is that the implants today are very durable. What we wanna to try to eliminate is the short-term problems that people have where the implant you know, is misaligned, where people are unhappy. Uh, we'd love to eliminate infections, but that's also you know, a big issue sometimes. Uh, very low infection rate with knee replacements, that, but that could lead to an early failure as well. So those are the things we wanna to try to eliminate. Okay, Bill Stein, I live alone. Do you have rehab facilities at the hospital? And very good question. Do we have rehab facilities at the hospital? The answer is yes, we do. And I will tell you that we make every effort to make sure that patients don't go to a rehab facility. Many studies have been performed which show that when the patients go to a rehab facility, they do very poorly. Uh, orthopedic surgeons don't like it because the patients are out of our control. We uh, the rehab facilities are really run by internists. Um, I would tell you that most of my patients don't go to rehab facilities, even those who live alone. We can usually set up a lot of home care where patients can be very comfortable getting around. As I said, a lot of these surgeries, at least the robotic stuff is done as an outpatient. Patients go home the same day and they really don't need to go to a rehab facility. So this is, this is sort of old world. Um, we have a rehab facility at Sibley Hospital, not to say that I wouldn't send a patient there if there were some issues which demanded that that patient need to go there. Usually those are medical issues. Sometimes if a patient has a problem after surgery and we feel they're not safe at home, we'll send them to a rehab facility, but it's very rare. <coughs> Michael says, besides accuracy, does a robotic procedure reduce invasiveness, size of the incision, reduce damage to the ligaments, tendons and muscles, and the answer is absolutely, because we can make adjustments to the bone cuts where we don't have to make as big an incision and we don't have to do as much what we call rebalancing. So balancing the knee, making sure the stability is really good is very important to the function of the knee. And sometimes we have to do a little bit of that, but sometimes we can customize how we position the implants in space, which will reduce the amount of ligament balancing, which requires more incisions, bigger incisions, more surgery. So I, I think that's a great question. And I think this is, this is where I see the benefit of the surgery, where I, as a surgeon, I don't have to make as big an incision, I'm a little less invasive, and I'm doing less ligament balancing. Why would, why would someone not be a good candidate for robotic assisted surgery? And the answer is, um, most people are good candidates. Some knees are gonna be so deformed and crooked, they may not be a good candidate for that. Uh, there may be circumstances where, you know, robotic surgeries sometimes take a little bit longer. They're usually done as outpatients and we might feel, you know, you'd be better off doing this as an inpatient, maybe staying a couple of days in the hospital. And we might say, it might be not uh, in your best interest to have robotic surgery. But most of the patients I'm pushing towards robotic surgery at this point. Can, uh, uh, can a new knee alignment throw other parts of your body off because they're using or working irregularly? And the answer is probably not. You know, uh, most of these knees that are misaligned, they usually come back to what we call an anatomical alignment. In other words, knees that are valgus, which is knock knee, or varus, which is sort of a cowboy knee, that's gonna usually throw your back or your hip off so that when your knee is properly aligned, your foot and hip and back will probably feel a whole lot better. Good question. 
How long is rehab in general? So uh, the rehab is, again, started almost immediately. It started right after surgery the next day. Um, it's, it's usually in the home for a week or so, and then usually in an outpatient facility. I would say on the average two months, sometimes three months. That's on the average. I've had some patients sometimes struggle with surgery and they sometimes needed more than that. Is robotic more expensive? How much more and does the insurance typically cover it? So is robotic more expensive? The answer is no, uh, it doesn't alter the cost of the procedure. That technology is absorbed by the facility um, and it doesn't cost any more to have robotic surgery. Karen asks, what is the youngest age recommended for a knee replacement? And the answer is, um, I have done knee replacements for people who are 30 years old. I mean, some, there are rare circumstances where people have had, you know, tremendous amount of trauma to their knee and bad arthritis, they can't walk and they have to have their knee replaced where there's no other option. I would say the most of the knee replacements we're doing are between 50 and 70. Uh, age, I wanna point out is not a, a criteria for joint replacement surgery. So we've sometimes had people in their 80s and into the late 80s and sometimes 90s and have felt that they're good uh, candidates for surgery. So uh, we don't use age as a criteria. Okay, John says, I've had two partials 15 years ago or more. Is there a lot of discomfort now to get two totals? The menisci on the other side of knee replacements feel like they're wearing out. Okay, good question from John. So he's had partials, they've gone 10 to 15 years and that's not unusual for the other side of the joint to start to wear out. Uh, conversion, it's interesting, conversion of partials to full is very, very, very similar to working on a native or virgin knee. So those patients actually do pretty well. Um, so taking a partial out and converting it to a full knee replacement is really not that big of a deal. It's certainly much less surgery than converting a full knee replacement to what we call a revision surgery. So I would encourage John to go ahead and get his knees converted to full. Another question, how long is recovery from a total knee replacement? I think we dealt with this before. I would say on the average, full knee replacement is two to three months uh, till you're out playing golf and tennis again. That's about the average. How, uh, anonymous, how long until I can drive? The OA knee is in the driving knee. How many PT visits at home? Okay, so if your osteoarthritis is in your driving knee and you're driving with your right knee, let's assume it's your, your right-handed, uh, you're probably going to have to drive at four to six weeks. It, it does take a little bit of time to get you know, control over your leg to the point where you're safe. So I'd say four to six weeks to drive a car uh, with a operation on the right knee. Post-op from Patricia. Uh, I'm sorry, here's another one uh, from an anonymous attendee. Is recovery time less with robotics? What is the typical re recovery time? So I don't think recovery time is really less with robotics. I think overall it's about the same. I just think the patients feel like their knee feels a more natural uh, after surgery. Uh, I look at these knees and I feel like they're better balanced. To me, they feel better. I, I, however, I just think that the time is about the same. Okay, Patricia, post-op after knee replacement, are you up walking before discharge? And the answer is, Yes, you're walking immediately. You can't get out of the facility unless you're walking. Uh, again, this is same day discharge. In other words, you have to walk, you have to get up and you have to walk on your knee you're using a walker uh, and you're putting full, all your weight on it. Uh, so, and it doesn't hurt very much because it's numbed up pretty well. So the patients really walk out of the facility pretty, pretty quickly. Okay, anonymous, anonymous attendee, 20 years ago, Dr. Kobe, and I remember him very well, said my knees were bone on bone. Five years ago, another removed fluid to fix a problem and said my knees were furry. What does this mean? Now my knees are much worse. So it, it sounds like you, your knees are getting more and more compromised, that the bone is sort of what we call disintegrating. That's what happens over time is that the bone can rub away and it can cause what we call large defects and stiffness of your knees to the point where you're having difficulty walking. I would assume that your knees don't, don't feel very good and probably are very stiff. And probably you're at the point where if you're healthy enough, you should might consider having your knees fixed. 
Here's a question from Milan. If you would like general surgery, will you let me? And the answer is I'll let you have general uh, anesthesia uh, versus spinal, but I'll encourage you to try spinal. Uh, some people can have spinal. Sometimes they've had a fusion. Sometimes they have a you know, concern about getting needles stuck in their back. Patients do much better with spinal. That's been proven in multiple reports. Uh, so we really discourage general, but general is used occasionally and there's nothing wrong with using general anesthesia. So yes, I will let you have general anesthesia. From Linda, I have a, a trip planned before undergoing knee replacement. Will hyaluronic acid temporarily help my pain and, and uh, walking ability? And the answer to that is yes, but you have to be careful, Linda, that you don't schedule your surgery too close to your injections. These these injections are what we call anti-inflammatory. We're really more concerned about cortisone injections than hyaluronic acid, but I don't like to have operations within six to eight weeks of a hyaluronic acid injection for knee replacement. So for injections of cortisone, I will make patients wait two to three months because the cortisone will increase the chance of infection. For hyaluronic acid, it's usually six to eight weeks. Anonymous again, both knees are bone on bone. How, would, how do you space robotic knee replacements when you do both knees? Good question. So usually it's six weeks uh, in between procedures, sometimes three months, depends upon how well you're doing. Um, can be sh as short as six weeks, but it's usually three months. Okay, Patricia says, how long is the wait time for appointments? Our wait time for new patients is, is a couple of weeks. Um, there are two, patient, two doctors in our office that do joint replacements. They're primarily myself uh, and Dr. Melvin, um, and, we, and we're taking new patients at this time. Linda says, how long before you can climb stairs? And the answer is you can climb stairs immediately. So right after surgery, we expect you to be able to go up and down the stairs. Now, the 24 hours right after surgery, I will put you in a knee brace. So the first day, night, you're not bending your knee. So you may have to hop up the knee, uh, hop up the stairs. But the next day that knee brace comes off, the physical therapist arrives at your house and you're allowed to go up and down the stairs freely. From Karen, how long do knee replacements last? I think we covered this, probably on the order of 20 to 30 years. Anonymous again, as an older patient with some health issues, I would likely need to stay in the hospital overnight. Also, would I, would I have to have a spinal? So the answer is in the hospital, you can stay several nights. And it gets back to that question that somebody asked before about if I live alone or I'm unsure about going home alone, we'll keep you in the hospital several nights. And there's nothing wrong with that. What we don't wanna do is we don't want you to go to the rehab facility. So if you require two, three, four, five nights in the hospital, we'd rather do that than send you to the rehab facility. We'll work with you in the hospital. We'll make sure you feel comfortable. We'll, we'll guide you depending upon what our physical therapists say in terms of your safety. If they say you're safe, you're, you're walking down the hallway, you can go up and down the stairs, we'll try to get you home. That's our, our philosophy. So Ava says, had knee replacements 12720, that's about a year ago, was supposed to have other knee done in January, but the total knee was very stiff, hurts a lot. It hurts much more than my non-surgical knee. So why get it done? Feels very fake, clunks and thunks, peg leg. Many days it makes me limp. The doctor says, well, you are old, so your joints are creaky. So I don't know what's going on with this knee. It may be a situation where you've reacted very strongly to the knee operation with a lot of scar tissue that occasionally happens very rarely, or it might be the circumstance where maybe this knee has some misalignment issues that has led to it feeling clunky and weak and stiff. So I don't know exactly. I'd have to have you come into the office and let me look at it. So Kristen says, I need both knees replaced. Can you do both at the same time? Okay, great question. And the answer is yes, but not usually. So you have to be very young. We're talking about people below 65, no medical problems and have knees that really have very few issues. So those patients are rare. Most of the time we like to space these out and what we call um, stagger them over time. Infection rate. 
Great question. What is our infection rate? Our, at Sibley Hospital, we're below the national average. <clears throat> the national average is about 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5. We're at 0.3. Uh, it goes up and down, to be honest with you. Uh, but we're pretty good at watching infections. We are. Uh, we have state-of-the-art uh, operating rooms. Uh, we make the best effort to try to reduce infections, antibiotics, spacesuits, protocols that are homogeneous across all the surgeons that operate there. Uh, we make every effort to make sure that our infection rate is the lowest possible. I want to point out to you that infection rates are very much tied to the, uh, unfortunately, to a lot of what we call comorbidities. Sometimes patients are not great candidates for surgery. They have significant weight problems. They have diabetes, they're on steroids, and they sometimes get infections. And it's not really the procedure or the hospital that causes the infection. Sometimes, unfortunately, the patients bring that uh, as a risk factor. Anonymous, what kind of improvements can we expect or you can forecast in the next five to 10 years regarding knee replacement surgery techniques and time recovery? And I think the question is a very good question. I think the implants are pretty much state of the, the art. I think we're going to see a little bit more uncemented technology going forward. I'm not so sure that's going to make that much of a difference to the older patient population. I think the robotic technologies will improve the outcomes of the procedure. I think that our perioperative management of pain has gotten tremendously positive uh, and, and really successful at, at managing patients' uh, operations, where we're using very few narcotics, the patients are recovering quickly. So I think we're really there uh, in regards to that. I certainly would, would tell you that I think there'll be some improvements in that over time. But today, as I said before, Medicare has said all these operations are outpatients. I mean, and there's your, you know, the government telling you right now, these are outpatient procedures. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has to be an outpatient. Uh, some of the older, sicker paper people are going to be done in the hospital, but the majority of the patients are going to be done as outpatients. From Linda, so Linda says it's covered by Medicare. Yes, Medicare covers these operations. And Michael says, is robotic surgery more expensive procedure and is it covered by insurance? I covered that already. It's not more expensive and covered by insurance. Anonymous attendees, do you know about the 3D-based knee replacement and if anyone is performing this in DC? And the answer is people have looked into this, but that is not the way to go. Uh, this is the way to go. The robotic surgery is the most state-of-the-art uh, way of adjusting knee replacement and getting the knee replacements done in the most effective fashion. The 3D does not work. Linda says, to your knowledge, are the majority of surgeons now using robotic assisted surgery? And the answer is yes. I think most of our surgeons in our hospital are using robotic surgery. Uh, most of the surgeons in the area are beginning to use robotic surgery. It's becoming state of the art. Kathleen says, can a patient expect to have a revision every few years? And the answer is no. I mean, these operations, if performed properly and if rehab properly are probably gonna last 20 to 30 years and the chances of having a second operation is very, very, very small. Karen says, how many knee replacements can be done over time considering the age of 40? Okay. So the answer is uh, knee replacements and revisions can be done over and over again, as long as the bone stock, available bone is, is, is reasonable. And as long as the patients are not having any complications. So a uh, patient of 40, I would probably recommend an uncemented implant uh, to try to get better, uh, you know, longer longevity of the implant, more durability. Uh, what would happen 20, 30, 40 years down the line? It's impossible to say, but one would expect that that would probably uh, uh, last 20 to 30 years at least. Abby says, what is the turnaround time between seeing you initially and the actual procedure? So we're scheduling this procedure two to three months out after we see patients um, so we have an outpatient setting, we have the inpatient setting. So we have limited time in both sp uh, spots. So our, our, our schedules are getting booked up at this point in time, I would say two to three months. John says, are you saying you can't do both knees at the same time? So the answer is I answered this before, we can do knees at the same time if you're healthy and 
you have no medical problems and you're way below 65, uh, we can do both knees at the same time. Anonymous, can an individual who has a bad knee due to arthritis and RA have robotic knee replacements? And the answer is yes, you can have robotic knee replacements. Kathleen says, can we expect recovery? Can, can a patient expect to have revisions every few years? And the answer is no, I would expect these implants to last a long time and you'd not need a revision. Margie says, do all knee replacements have an ugly scar down the middle? And the answer is yes, it's not ugly. <laughs> I, I think we can make it very nice and very cosmetic, uh, but it has to be down the middle and um, there's no way of getting around that. Patricia says, thank you for your time. Thank you, Patricia, Patricia for your great questions tonight. What is your success rate from the uh, anonymous attendee? Uh, our success rate is, is very good, very high. I would say in the high 90 percentile, very few infections, very few complications. Um, what do you think of the conformist knee? Uh, I think the conformist knee is a good knee. I don't think it's any better than any other knee, um, but uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Does Dr. Melvin do robotics? Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Roma, uh, Re, Melvin does exactly what I do. And the last question, does Medicare cover the outpatient stay uh, was kept overnight for the first knee, even after the really hard 70 years old spouse one? So the answer is Medicare covers the outpatient surgery. It covers outpatient surgery, whether done at the hospital or the outpatient facility. It covers your knee replacement, if you stay as an inpatient, if you come in as an outpatient, you decide you don't wanna go home, you wanna stay a couple of days, you can do that. So Medicare is very flexible. It covers all venues uh, at this point in time. So again, I'd like to close tonight. Thank you for all your questions. You guys have done great. And um, any more questions, feel free to contact the office. Thank you.